Hello and welcome and I hope you're keeping well. This will be a very short video but I think it promises to be a very important one because it's on an experiment that occurs quite regularly in the Leaving Cert physics paper and that is the experiment to measure the specific latent heat of vaporization of water. Now like all the heat experiments it involves something losing energy and something else picking up the same amount of energy. But before we look at the specifics of the experiment and how it's carried out, I think it's very important to remind ourselves about the definition of the specific latent heat of vaporization of water. Now, the definition of specific latent heat of vaporization of water is that this is the energy or heat needed to change the state of one kilogram of water from liquid state to vapor gas state without causing a change of temperature. In other words, if we have one kilogram of water at its boiling point, 100 degrees Celsius, and we wish to convert this into one kilogram of water vapor of gas at the same temperature, then we have to add a whopping 2,300,000 2, joules of energy in order to achieve this. And this number here is the actual number, the value for the specific latent heat of vaporization of water. Uh, it's often written like this. Uh, Specific latent heat of vaporization of water, LVAP, is 2.3 by 10 to the power of 6 joules per kilogram. You notice there is no per degree there because we are not having, we are not seeing a change of temperature in this, in this change. So that's the definition there. That's one that needs to be learned. And the number there doesn't have to be recalled, but a lot of people seem to recall it anyway. Now, like I always do, here is a little checklist of what you should know at the end of this video after studying this topic. You need to know a label diagram of the equipment used for the experiment, what measurements are taken and with what instruments. You should know the formula and be able to use it to do calculations. You need to know several precautions that will make the final result more accurate. One particular precaution that we've come across before involves pre-cooling the water in the calorimeter, and you should be able to do the question that came up on this topic in the 2015 Leaving Cert Honours paper. Now, before we look at the experiment in more detail, here is a super quick run through of the experiment. The experiment involves uh, creating steam, generating steam by heating water. That steam goes into, through a delivery tube, and into water in a copper calorimeter. The steam here loses energy. And that energy is gained by the water and gained by the calorimeter. So we can equip, we can put two things to uh, equal to each other. The energy lost by the steam and the energy gained by the water and the calorimeter will have to be equal because if something loses energy, something else has to gain the same amount of energy. And from that equivalence, we create a formula. And from that formula, we will tr try to measure the specific latent heat of vaporization of the water. There's one unique part of this experiment that people tend to often overlook, and that is the device there known as a steam trap, or better still, a water trap, that only allows steam to pass through it and stops any water. More about that later. Now we're going to take a more detailed look at the equipment and its setup used for this experiment. This part of the equipment is known as a steam generator, and it simply lives up to its name. It is um, a round bottom flask in which water is boiled and converted into steam, and a hot plate, electric hot plate, or a Bunsen burner can be used to cause the, the generation of the steam. We will know the temperature of the steam because we measure it with this thermometer here, and just note that the thermometer is actually in the steam, it's placed in the steam, and not the boiling water underneath. The generated steam will move up through this delivery tube, as it's known, and into this part of the apparatus here. The steam will then go into cold water, which is in a cold calorimeter. One thing to note is that the delivery tube is actually sloped backwards towards the steam generator. This is to make sure that any steam that condenses and turns to water in this part of the delivery tube will flow back into the steam generator and will not flow forward into the calorimeter. We have our water in the copper calorimeter. Uh, we insulate the calorimeter to prevent heat loss to the surroundings with some lagging and we generally have, and there it is, a thermometer in this part of the apparatus as well. Now it's in here that the real action takes place, that energy is lost 
by the steam and energy is gained by the water so the steam uh, bubbles in there it condenses it immediately loses energy and that energy is gained by the water and the calorimeter and by equating two things together the energy lost by the steam and the energy gained by the water plus the energy gained by the calorimeter we can come up with an equation and from that equation we can calculate the specific latent heat of vaporization of the water and so here is the formula that I just referred to. It says the energy lost by the steam will be the energy gained by the water plus the energy gained by the calorimeter. We are assuming that no energy is absorbed or taken by the surroundings and we take precautions to minimize that occurring, but we'll talk about that later. So in essence, the energy lost by the steam will equal the energy gained by the water plus the energy gained by the calorimeter. Now the energy gained by water and calorimeter is the easy part of the equation because there's no change of state involved. So the energy gained by the water can be uh, calculated using this expression here, mass of water by specific capacity of water by change of temperature of water. That's the energy gained by the water. And the energy gained by the calorimeter, we can use exactly the same formula, the mass of the calorimeter multiplied by the specific heat capacity of the calorimeter. Well, it's made of copper, so it's a specific heat capacity of copper multiplied by the change of temperature of the calorimeter. So we can work out and calculate the energy gained by the water in joules and the energy gained by the calorimeter in joules. That will have to equal the energy lost by the steam because if something loses energy, something else has to gain the equivalent amount of energy. Now, the energy lost by the steam is actually in two chunks, and it's the second chunk that presents some problems to students, so we'll look at that very carefully. Well, the first thing is very simple. When the steam enters the cold water, it will convert, it will change from steam, which is a gas, back into water, which is a liquid. So it will lose the energy that it had due to the fact it was a gas. And as we know well, that energy is known as latent heat. So the latent heat lost by the steam can be calculated using this formula. That's the formula we use when there's a change of state. And it's the mass of the steam multiplied by the specific latent heat of vaporization of water. This is the latent heat lost by the steam when it changes from steam back into water. It's this part that uh, confuses people a little bit. And think about it this way. When the steam condenses back into water, when that change of state occurs, there's no change of temperature. So when the steam has condensed back into water, the water will be at 100 degrees Celsius and it will be in cold water in the cold calorimeter, so it'll lose even more energy. And this is the energy lost by the steam, which is now water, it's condensed back to water, after it has changed state. So the steam will lose its latent heat, but it will also lose another chunk of energy after changing state. And this will be the mass of the steam, even though it's now water, same mass, the specific heat capacity of water because the steam has condensed down to water and the change of temperature of the steam. So by multiplying these three things together, we'll get the energy lost by the steam immediately after it has changed state. And by multiplying these two things together, we will get the energy lost by the steam as it changes state, in other words, it's latent heat. By putting all these things together, then the one thing we're looking for, the specific latent heat of vaporization of water, can be obtained, can be calculated, if we know everything else in the formula. And many students and a lot of people say, well, this is a pretty daunting formula. It has quite a lot of parts in it. First thing I will point out that there's mass in every single part there. That means we can leave all our masses in grams. Not the ideal thing, but it works in this case. The second thing is that everything else other than what we're looking for has to be obtained in the experiment. So it's going to be quite easy to measure the mass of the calorimeter with electronic balance and the mass of the water with an electronic balance. We will talk in particular how we measure the mass of the steam later in this video, but in general we measure it by subtraction at the very end of the experiment. The rise in temperature of the water and the rise in temperature of the calorimeter will always be the same, and we use, obviously, a thermometer to do that. The drop in temperature of the steam, obviously, will also be thermometers. The steam will start at 100, it will end at some other number, and the difference between those two temperatures will be the change in temperature of the steam. Um, that formula has to be learned. There's no other way out of it. It simply has to be learned, and um, once we've learned it, then we can use it to do calculations and find our value for the specific latent heat of vaporization of water, which is what we're looking for in this experiment. 
Now, very shortly, we're going to, I'm going to show you how to use that uh, formula in order to actually put in values and calculate a value for the specific latent heat of vaporization of water. But before that, we're going to look at some precautions that are normally taken in order to make the final result of the experiment more accurate. Now, these precautions are quite uh, well known to you, and they can be used for a wide variety of experiments. Um, we can lag the calorimeter well with cotton wool or any other insulating material like polystyrene foam to minimize heat loss to the surroundings. By surroundings, we mean, usually mean the air. Uh, we can put a lid on the calorimeter to minimize heat loss to the air around the calorimeter. And we normally use a thermometer with low heat capacity, which minimizes heat absorbed from the water that we're trying to measure the temperature of. We normally use a sensitive, or we can always use a more sensitive thermometer, and that means it measures to more places of decimal. A typical uh, type of more sensitive thermometer would be a digital thermometer that usually measures to one or two places of decimal. We can polish the calorimeter, and that will reduce energy losses to uh, the surroundings due to radiation. And with all these precautions, I very much like giving the precaution and then giving the reason why in the one sentence. That often will catch you marks in an exam that you might not have got otherwise. Now, there are two precautions in particular that I want you to pay special attention to. These actually are asked quite a lot in exams when this question comes up. The first precaution is to make absolutely sure that only steam enters into the calorimeter and not what is known as wet steam, which is steam with water inside in it. Uh, and to stop water getting into the calorimeter instead of steam, we slope the delivery tube away from the calorimeter. So any steam that condenses in the delivery tube will flow back down into the steam generator. Better still, we can use a device known as a steam trap, which only allows steam to flow through it into the calorimeter. The reason for this, you need to pay great attention to. If water ended up going into the calorimeter along with the steam, then this water would already have changed state and it would already have lost its latent heat. So it could not give latent heat to the water in the calorimeter because it's already done so. In other words, steam can't change state twice. So. A nice sentence that you should learn is this. If wet steam, steam and water, is added to the calorimeter, this will add mass to the water in the calorimeter, but without adding latent heat to it. It cannot change state twice. That's a very important precaution, and I would like you to note it and learn it. And the second important precaution that I want you to pay particular attention to is one that can come up in a variety of experiments. And this is where the water in the calorimeter can be pre-cooled before adding the steam into it. Uh, pre-cooled by, we'll say, placing it in a fridge or something like that for a few minutes uh, before the start of the experiment. So if the water is pre-cooled, this will mean that when the water in the calorimeter is below room temperature, then it will absorb heat from the surroundings. You allow steam to go in, the water in the calorimeter then will rise above room temperature and will be giving out heat to the surroundings. And all other things being equal, the energy gained from the surroundings at the start of the experiment and the energy lost to the surroundings near the end of the experiment will be approximately equal. For example, if you pre-cool, if you pre-cool the water in the calorimeter to 15 degrees below room temperature, it will absorb heat from the surroundings. If you then add the steam until the water in the calorimeter goes to 15 degrees above room temperature, it will give out heat to the surroundings, and the heat absorbed from the surroundings will be approximately equal to the heat given out to the surroundings, and that minimizes heat loss to the surroundings. Very important precaution, so make sure you learn it. And another thing that's worthy of note is the following. The largest source of error in this experiment will be the calculation of the mass of the steam. In other words, the smallest figure that you're going to put into the equation will be the mass of the steam. In other words, the larger the mass of the steam, the better, because larger numbers reduce percentage errors. 
And one way of increasing the mass of the steam is again to pre-cool. This is a second advantage of pre-cooling the water in the calorimeter. If you pre-cool the water in the calorimeter, that means you can add more steam, a greater mass of steam. And the larger the mass of the steam, the better, because that reduces your percentage errors. If we go back and have a very, very quick look at our formula again up here, the smallest value that you're going to put into this formula is the mass of the steam over here and here. The larger that number, the better, because the larger the numbers, the more you will reduce your percentage errors. And one way of getting a large mass of steam is to pre-cool the water in the calorimeter. That allows more steam to actually uh, be created in the water. Something I almost forgot, and that would be very remiss of me. It is often asked in Leaving Cert papers, how was the mass of the steam found? How do you calculate the mass of the steam? Well, that is very, very, very easy. You get the mass of the calorimeter and its contents at the end of the experiment. So that would be the mass of the water, the calorimeter, and the steam that was added to it. And you get the mass of the calorimeter and the water at the start of the experiment, and you simply subtract them. And the extra mass contained in the calorimeter at the end of the experiment will clearly be the mass of the steam. So how do you get the mass of the steam? You get the mass of calorimeter plus water and steam at the end, and you subtract from it the mass of the calorimeter and water at the start. Uh, even that equation would, would get you full marks in a leaving cert. And finally, we're going to take a look at a Leaving Cert question on this topic. Now, this is the Leaving Cert question, question two, I think, from Artash de Sardelevale, 2015, 2015. I think it's actually come up one sense, but there's something very interesting in this question. Whereas when we normally do the experiments, we use a copper calorimeter. In this question, they do not use a copper calorimeter. Instead of a copper calorimeter, they say the cold water was placed in a polystyrene cup. That is one of those uh, foam coffee cups uh, that we're all familiar with. Now, a polystyrene cup will have a very low heat capacity. In other words, it will not absorb any or very much heat from the, the, the water inside in it. Um, and a polystyrene cup, of course, also polystyrene would be an insulator, a heat insulator. It would not conduct much heat. So that is actually quite unique. This means something very interesting. If we use a polystyrene cup that has a low heat capacity, then we can actually assume that it does not absorb any heat at all from the steam or from the water. So the energy gained by the calorimeter in our experiment, we can ignore. We can ignore that part of the formula totally because the polystyrene coffee cup, the foam cup, will not absorb very much energy. So we can dispense with that part of the formula. Not the rest, just that part. So now let's run through this question. In an experiment to measure the specific latent heat of vaporization of water, cold water was placed in a polystyrene cup. Dry steam was then added to the water. Dry steam means it's literally dry. There's no droplets of water in it. The following data were was recorded. Mass of the polystyrene cup in grams. Initial mass of polystyrene cup in water. So by subtraction, you can clearly get the mass of the water. The initial temperature of the water was 11 degrees. The temperature of steam was 100 degrees. And when the steam went into the cold water, the final temperature of everything came to 30 degrees. So looking at 11 and 30, you can work out the rise in temperature of the water. And we don't need, in this case, as we said earlier, the rise in temperature of the calorimeter. We're assuming that uh, it doesn't absorb heat. And we can work out clearly the drop in temperature of the steam. The final mass of the polystyrene cup and water was 87.2 grams. That's up from 84.6. So by subtraction there, we can clearly find the mass of the, the steam. Um, draw a label diagram of the apparatus used in the experiment. That's easy enough. It's one you have to learn. And uh, draw it in black. Label in red always seems to work for me. Uh, a student used this data to calculate the specific latent heat of vaporization of water. State two assumptions that the student made about the polystyrene cup when carrying out this calculation. Well, the main assumption the student would have to make is that the polystyrene cup does not absorb any great amount of heat from the system. So it has a low heat capacity. Another assumption would be that the polystyrene cup is an insulator. It is not a conductor. Use the data given above to calculate the specific latent heat of vaporization of water. 22 marks out of the 40, so it's a large chunk of marks. So let's look at that part next. Um, label diagram, well, as in notes, things that students tend to forget, 
Uh, thermometer must be in the steam generator, not um, uh, you make sure there's a thermometer there. Um, also put a thermometer in the cal in the calorimeter. Slope the delivery tube back towards the steam generator is important, and the delivery tube must be under the water. Okay. Uh, the two assumptions, as we talked about there, it, the polystyrene cup has a low heat capacity and it has it is a good insulator of heat. Use the data above to calculate the specific latent heat of vaporization of water. Notice the first thing I did here. The first thing I did here was to work out the mass of the water by subtraction there and the mass of the steam by subtraction, as I said earlier, and the change in temperature of the steam and the change in temperature of the water there by subtraction. I think it's a very good idea to show this working out before you go anywhere. It gives you a base to from which to continue. Then I wrote down my formula and I started putting things in. It's very important to note that this formula has mass, 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 four parts in the formula, and it's got mass in each part, each part of those four parts. That means you're perfectly justified in putting in masses as grams. So we put in the masses as grams there, mass of steam, mass of steam, mass of water, mass of calorimeter. We put in the changes in temperature of the water, the change in temperature of the steam. We're given the specific capacity of water and the specific capacity of copper. We ignore this whole uh, energy gained by the calorimeter because it is polystyrene, so we assume it absorbs almost zero heat from the system. Working through the maths there, by the way, once you've got to this stage here, you've sub, um, substituted in your values and into a correct formula. You've got most of the marks at that stage. The rest is mathematics. You use a calculator. You get through it. And I got a final answer of 2.255 by 10 to the power of 6 joules per kilogram. Be very careful about your units here. For specific latent heat, it's joules per kilogram because there is no change of temperature. And the last part of this question asks about some of the precautions taken and this is obviously very very common in these kind of questions the student ensured the student made sure that the steam one that the steam had been dried and two that the water in the calorimeter was initially um, pre-cooled before starting the experiment how did each of these steps improve the accuracy of the experiment well we'll take them one at a time first the steam has been dried the steam has been dried well I'm going to say how it has been dried and why it was dried. Well, it was dried using a steam trap, or you can also say that the delivery tube was uh, sloped back towards the steam generator. And what is the advantage? Why is the steam dried? Well, wet steam, steam with droplets of water in it, will have already changed state. It will already have lost its latent heat, so it cannot give latent heat to the water in the calorimeter. It's already lost its latent heat. Um, the second part of that is why would the water in the cup, why would the water in the calorimeter be pre-cooled? Well, how was it pre-cooled? First, it was pre-cooled by placing it for a short time in a fridge. And why? what is the advantage of pre-cooling the water in the calorimeter? As we said earlier, as we explained earlier, the heat gained from the surroundings when a, the water is below room temperature will be approximately equal to the heat lost when the water is above room temperature near the end of the experiment. Heat lost approximately equal to heat gained. And as I mentioned earlier, there's another advantage of pre-cooling the water in the calorimeter. You generally can condense a larger mass of steam and that will improve your percent, reduce your percentage errors. Okay, uh, hopefully that has been of some use to you. Um, thank you very much for paying attention.